فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافاتي وتنهل من روب الخير This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We shall always praise Allah. No matter what the condition is, we will always praise Allah. We do always praise praise Allah and we should be always praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household his companions in fact all those who taught us the goodness that we have today and we ask Allah to make us part of those whom at some stage in the future the people will be sending blessings upon because we too contributed towards their goodness at some stage may allah make it easy for us and grant us all jannatul firdaus i mean this evening i'm speaking to brothers and sisters whom i believe have contributed in a great way to alleviating the suffering of those who are suffering yet we all have our own struggles that's the amazing amazing way that allah has created us there is not a single one from amongst us who would not have faced some form of negativity or hurdle in his or her life that's the plan of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however i'd like to let you know that part of the plan of allah is the more you help others the less or the lesser your burden becomes regarding your own issues and problems my father may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him a good and healthy long life mashallah has worked for more than five decades helping and assisting thousands of people in rural Zimbabwe get educated, study, learn, empower them. Lots of business projects and so many other projects over the years. Primarily the education. And when we see people who then become something, mashallah, tabarakallah, on earth, not just in our country, but overseas, it brings a smile to the face. So once he was asked, you know, you have so many children of your own. How did you manage them while you were so busy in this, you know, life of yours? If you go or if you did visit at that time my home, you would hardly find my dad at home. Yes, he was there every evening. He was there sometimes for lunch. But that's it. We saw him for a short period of time. Allah placed in his life a lot of baraka a lot of baraka all his children he attempted to make them hafiz at home and he succeeded with most of them some of them you know how it is we quit halfway subhanallah I'm not talking about myself but mashallah he taught them all arabic he taught them all the knowledge of the deen while he was busy doing a lot of work i remember i became a hafiz i used to spend 15 to 20 minutes with my father every day just after his afternoon nap subhanallah and i was busy most of the afternoon preparing for it yes his strictness was a different level that was the generation subhanallah but it worked people asked him and i remember this question quite clearly on one of the radio stations some time later how did you manage he says i didn't i was busy serving the underprivileged trying to take care of them while allah was taking care of my children and wallahi it's a fact wallahi it's a fact i promise you كان الله في عون العبد ما كان العبد في عون اخيه never ever doubt that hadith Allah will continue to help a slave for as long as that person is busy helping another. Subhanallah. Guaranteed words of Rasulullah sallallahu I have seen it in my own life. If you are sincerely trying to help others and each one of us busy in our own lives, we need the doctors, the accountants, the solicitors, we need or the professionals we need everyone we need those perhaps who are just volunteers those who might not be doing so much those who are businessmen 
Subhanallah, when we have this big team we make together, what is known as the Ummah. And you know what? We would need those who are in need in order for us to be used to fulfill that need to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're always taught to thank Allah that the poor have been placed in front of us so that we can help them. If you didn't know who was poor, how are you going to even fulfill your zakah, which is compulsory? So when people are facilitating this for you in a good manner, in a transparent way that you are satisfied, thank Allah and make dua for them. They've made it easy for you. While we're earning, how much are we going to spend in our lives? A million, a billion, I heard one of the scholars say, on a global level it should be banned for someone to be more than to be worth more than one billion. I said, You're gonna make a lot of enemies. Subhanallah. But the idea was how much are you going to use? The rest of it should be given to others. If you want to bless your children or give them some of what Allah's blessed you with, you need to know they've come with their own share as well. That Allah will give them maybe more than you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have written for them something totally different. Yes, it's important to, to try, and I know a lot of us do, to settle our children. If Allah's given you and then He's given you more, during your life, do things. Recently I spoke about how we give more importance to do deeds we don't do in our lives for those who are dead and did not do in their own lives. Do you know what that means? I've done a bit of a research, meaning a little bit of a study with some people in one community without mentioning them, but I'm sure it's quite similar in a lot of our communities. They say, okay, I'm not speaking about what's right and wrong, what's permissible and not, but they say, if you ask them, when last have you read the whole Quran? They'll say, well, when that brother died, I read the entire Quran. And when this brother died, I attended, you know, the recitations of the Quran. Like I told you, I'm not discussing what's right and wrong and what's ideal and not. But I'm saying... We read Qur'an on behalf of the dead without even knowing or without even having read it for ourselves and sometimes knowing or not knowing the controversy surrounding whether or not we can do what we want to do for a dead person. I usually tell people and I've been asked recently, can I please read Salah for the dead? And I said, do you have a guarantee that that Salah is even going to be accepted? And how can you donate something that you don't even know was yours in the first place? It's like telling Allah, I'm going to read this two rakats of salah. I know it's done. So I'm going to now give it to the dead person. And Allah says, hang on, hang on. Who guaranteed you that this salah was even accepted for you to be able to donate? But yes, if you had money in your hand, it's yours. You can give it. It's a charity. And say, oh Allah, this is on behalf of the deceased. How many of us have drilled wells on behalf of the dead? Today, I want to encourage you to drill wells for yourself before you die. Because that deed is plugged in totally. The other one, there is still a doubt whether or not Allah will take it on behalf of that person. It's maybe. That's what it is. When you do hajj for someone who's passed away, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be accepted unless they have written it to be done for them. Then their farad is fulfilled. If they haven't written it, and you're doing it just because you feel like there is a chance Allah will accept it, and there is a chance He won't. Who knows? So this is why we say, and I want to encourage you today, do whatever you can while you're alive, for yourself, for your family members. They're alive, I'm doing it now, I'm going to read Qur'an. There's no controversy about reading Qur'an, not at all. There's no controversy about fulfilling your five daily prayers and a little bit more. Subhanallah, your sunnah, how many of us, Allah's blessed us with millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands. And you know what? Our salah is not in order. I guarantee you, my brothers and sisters of late, I've been saying if you were to look at your condition, 30 years back, 20 years back, depending on your age, I swear by Allah, today, you're in a much better position, but you might have more complaints than you did a long time back. Ask yourself, where was I? Where was my father 40 years back? What happened? What was my condition a few years ago? I probably didn't even afford eating out. And today, every weekend, today we'll own the whole restaurant, mashallah. Yes, that's what it is. And we're still complaining about what? You know what? If you really want the help of Allah, one quick way of doing it is to help others. Find them, look for them. 
Look for the best, those who deserve it the most. Search for them. It's not going to be easy to find them, but sometimes you have organizations like these that would actually help you do the job. They'll go for you to the areas that perhaps you wouldn't even know how to get to. May Allah make it easy for all of us. While you are helping someone, whether it is yourself or someone doing it on your behalf, Allah will take care of your needs for as long as a few conditions are met. One of them is you need to be sincere. It needs to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to be trying to earn the pleasure of Allah holistically in your life. Many times we get bogged down because of some weakness that we don't even feel is wrong anymore because of how often we've been doing it. May Allah grant us an awakening. I know weaknesses are weaknesses. We are human beings. We will fall. We will falter. But a mu'min, a true believer is the one who feels in the heart that you know what? What I've just done is wrong. That feeling is a sign that you're a mu'min. And this is why when you've committed a sin, the moment you regret it, and that would normally come within moments of the sin if you're a believer, that's a sign that you actually have a connection with Allah. If you didn't, you wouldn't have regretted anything. But when you get too used to sinning, the regret becomes less. The thought, the idea becomes less and less. So we are here to say an encouragement for myself and yourselves. May Allah strengthen us and give us the ability to begin with the regret. It's one of the conditions of tawbah to have regretted what you did. And then you say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, help me not to do it again. I, don't, I will not do it again. That's the promise from me. Even if human nature made you repeat it, But don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. The fact that you have regretted something that already shows you have belief in Allah. You actually have a connection with Allah. And the fact that you've sought forgiveness is good enough, my brothers and sisters. Don't let the devil come to you and make you perpetrate an even bigger crime, which is to lose hope in the mercy of Allah or to feel that Allah is not merciful enough for me. That's a bigger sin than any other sin that you could have committed. Besides, if you were to die in the condition of shirk and association of partnership with Allah. So don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, don't ever forget the ability of Allah. He is all able, all capable. In Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah is all able. All capable. There is nothing impossible for Allah. And He is all hearing. He hears. He responds. When the caller calls out to Him, He responds. When you want something from Allah, He will give it to you. Definitely. He will definitely give it to you. Either better than what you want or something you, you may not know is better. But He knows. But He won't leave you. No matter what you want, you've asked Allah. If it doesn't seem to be coming in your direction, you need to thank Allah double. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Because you need to know the captain of the ship is Allah. In fact, in a much higher way. That was just an example. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is higher than all of that. He is the owner. He's the one who made us. He's the one whom we're going to return to. Subhanallah. Definitely. When you've called out to Allah, if you doubt Allah for a moment, again, it's a sign of weakness of Iman. Don't. You need to know Allah will give me when it is correct, when the time is right, if it is the right thing. You know, we read dua of istikhara. Have you heard that word before? Istikhara. Istikhara is to seek the guidance of Allah. So you can read this. You, well, you should be reading these, the words that appear in the hadith. And in those words, which are repeated often by the one who's seeking the guidance of Allah, and they should be part of our daily recitals. Part of it is, oh Allah, if you know that what I am asking you for is good for me, my deen, my dunya, my, my life, my livelihood, my hereafter, then make it easy for me. Let it happen for me and give me blessings in it. And if you know that it's not good for me, my religion, my deen, my dunya, my livelihood, my life, my hereafter, my future, 
then keep it away from me, keep me away from it, and make me happy with what you have chosen for me. That's the part of the dua. So many of us read the dua, and we say, I made the istikhara, it is positive for me, but Allah is not doing it. Well, didn't you just tell Allah, well, if it's not good for me, don't do it, then it's not good for you. When you start seeing the negative signs, when Allah's created a blockage, it means He's keeping it away from you. It was part of your dua, but unfortunately you did not look into the meaning of it. That's why. Part of the dua is, oh Allah, if it's not good for me, create a barrier. Keep it away from me. So now you made a dua, and you're asking Allah's guidance, but you have already made your mind up. This is why some of the scholars say, when you are sure about something, don't make istikhara. Make dua, that Allah give you barakah. If you're sure about something, don't make istikhara. You make istikhara meaning you seek the guidance of Allah when you're confused about something. Otherwise, you've asked someone, you've actually gone out and perhaps engaged in what we know as consultation. You've consulted with a few who are experts, who love you, who care for you, and they've given you guidance in one direction. That's it. There's no need to then do the istikhara as we know it because you know what you want. You ask Allah, oh Allah, open the doors for me here. This is what I want. Give me barakah in it. But when you don't know and you're confused, you can make that dua. And if Allah facilitates it for you, Alhamdulillah, it's a good sign. And if He's blocked it for you or there's negativity that comes in it, it's not good. Leave it. Quit it. My brothers and sisters, when we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He hears. I want to give you an example that's come to my mind. I was in Umrah approximately two years back in April, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to meet people. Sometimes you're walking, something happens, and you have to take a detour. So there is a blockage, or there is someone there, or there is a lot of there are a lot of people, and you take you divert. And you don't know that perhaps there is someone in the other corner, somewhere at a distance, who made a dua at some point that they want to meet you. So Allah was just taking you this way. The GPS map within, which you didn't know about, was turning you, diverting you, and you had to go until you crossed paths. And they're like, my dua is just accepted. I just met this person. I'm going to share something like this with you. So there was a brother who I had, I had addressed a few of the Mu'tamireen, a few of those who were there in Mecca, just like I'm addressing you today. And there was a brother who really wanted to meet me and I had a message from someone to say, please meet this brother. And so when I finished, I called his name and I said, brother, I'd like to see you. And he was so happy and excited. And so I got up with him and I decided to choose a corner in the lobby of that hotel where very few people would actually notice us for the reason that we can have a good discussion without disturbance. And I sat with him and suddenly I noticed two women walking through that section, which was strange. One was in a wheelchair and they were not children. One was in a wheelchair, perhaps, maybe, I'm just guessing. You know, women don't like you to guess their age unless you're going to say she looks 12 years old. But subhanAllah, perhaps in her 20s or early 30s, maybe late 20s, I think. And the other one was much older, but she was wearing one of those medical masks. So I couldn't see and I, I didn't really, I, I have a habit. I greet male, female, no matter who it is, you greet. Salamu alaikum. Done. And you walk away. They can look at you like they've never been greeted before. Or they can... Think whatever they want, you did your duty and you carried on. Especially when you're passing each other. You're crossing. Pass. So, I noticed them coming past. The one was in a wheelchair and the other one was pushing the one in the wheelchair. So, I just, as I'm talking to this brother, I looked to the side and I said, Assalamu alaikum. And I kept on talking. And I heard the response, Wa alaikum as salam, and uh, they carried on. A moment later, the sister in the wheelchair pushed herself back 
And she says, are you who I think you are? So I looked and I'm thinking, you know, I have had people say it's Mushari al-Afasi, I have had people say it's Arifi, so I'm like, so who like, you know? Meaning, sorry, who? So she says, are you Mufti Mink? I said, yes. Oh, I've just been making dua that I see you. And I made a dua to Allah. No, so, so she says that and she was so happy. She says, I come from, I think it was the Netherlands. Yeah. And I come from here and, you know, I was really making dua. And look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great. And Allah is, you know, mashallah, tabarak. I'm like, subhanallah, we came to this corner. We came to this corner to run away from what Allah had just planned that you need to get to that corner. You hear what I'm saying? I have many such stories, not of myself, but others. But I'm telling you this because I haven't spoken about it. And it's, it's a very, very interesting story. Perhaps initially I might have related it, but here I am. And there's a reason why I say this. So the sister, I, I am a person, I don't like to ask questions. I don't like to ask personal questions. That's it. Do you know why? I don't like people to ask me personal questions either. So that's it. Alhamdulillah, take it. I greet it. MashaAllah, oh, you're from there. May Allah bless you, grant you goodness. You know, I, I wanted to know what's, what's wrong with the sister. But I just made a dua to say, may Allah grant her whatever is wrong with her. You know, it's none of my business. But I do know that she is in a, on a, in a wheelchair and she needs help. So I told her, you know, what's wrong? Have you guys just finished your umrah? Now, why I asked her was not to be inquisitive, but because they looked very sad. And I thought I had seen tears in the eyes of the older lady. And perhaps the tears may have been connected to anything. It might have been the joy of perhaps meeting someone you wanted to meet. Not to say I'm anyone great, but sometimes when people have benefited from you over the years, they get happy to see you, you know, in real life. Although, like I say, it's, it's, it doesn't mean that we're virtuous, but it's just that human excitement. So, subhanAllah, I, I thought to myself, they might, they're crying for some reason, or this person, the older person, at least looks quite sad. So, have you done your Umrah? So, so she said, no. I, we came in a group of, I think, 70 people, and because I'm disabled, they decided we cannot go with you for Umrah. You, we, we're all going, and you can go. Perhaps tomorrow we'll get someone to take you and to push you, and so on. And they were women in a big group. Without even thinking. Without even giving it a second thought, I got up, I said, I'll take you. I didn't need, I was sitting talking to a brother, which I could have spoken to him any other time. But this is something that is virtuous. And I'm, I'm relating it to you now, but these are little deeds that we would do immediately, without even thinking. Someone, an Umrah. And you know what? I was thinking something strange happened during that trip. My mom and dad were there with my brother. For Umrah. And I was meant to take, I had, I wanted to take my mother for the tawaf and the, the sa'i with her wheelchair. And unfortunately, my brother had already done that before I arrived. So I had felt it. For me, this was an opportunity now to push someone else. I don't mind who it is. And I know that they're disabled somehow. And so what I did is I said, okay, subhanallah, let's go, I'll push you. I think she thought it was a joke. So I didn't wait for a yes or a no. I got up and I started, I took the wheelchair and, said, and this brother says, Are you, you know, we were busy talking. Can I just, can I join you, you know? I said, yeah, you can join me. So he started, he, he came with me and we were talking while we were walking and we lost nothing and the mother's walking with us and I'm pushing the chair. And we went up, subhanallah. And I decided, you know what? We'll make it easy for them. If you go up to a certain floor, you have electric carts. You pay a little fee and you can have this electric cart so that they can do it on their own. And they, they don't need to have, you know, they, they don't need to be tied with us, but I can take them there at least. And I thought of it while I was going up. I heard a few people talking about it and I decided, let's go up. And subhanAllah, this brother, he was, by the way, he's based in London, the brother. And he told me, he said, subhanAllah, I've learned a lot here, man. I, you know, there's so much that's happened. I said, hey, brother, don't worry about all of that. Right now, we're concentrating on this umrah. Allah will give us a reward of the whole umrah, man. Come on. You know, we're going to take this reward away. He said, yeah. Uh, uh, he wanted to push as well. I said, no, 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 no. The agreement was me. 
So the sister says, you know what, my brother, Wallahi, before we left, because they were traveling, the two women, without their maharim, because they had a group, they were in, in a group, and the women generally are allowed to travel in that group, even though their mahram may not be there, according to a lot of scholars of other schools of thought. So to be honest with you, they were... She said, when we left, I made a dua to Allah. Oh Allah, help me to make this umrah in the best possible way. Help me to make this umrah in, in a way that would be, no one would rush me and it would be, you know, memorable with someone. Now she is saying, she obviously knew someone's going to push her. Someone had to push her. You know, with someone who's very patient and so on and someone who knows what they're doing so that it's their first time. I said, anyway, you don't have to tell me all of that. I don't fit that profile. But, alhamdulillah, it's Allah who brought us together. The sister says, please make a dua for me. I said, what would you like? She says, I want to get married. Okay, I said, may Allah grant you a spouse. Anyway, she's been making that dua for a long, long time. When they had completed their tawaf, and we, we, we completed it on our buggy, you know, it's like a golf cart, and they completed it on theirs, and then we, we went for the sa'i. We were not in ihram, so we didn't have to do the sa'i, and there is no voluntary sa'i. So they did the sa'i while we were waiting for them, came back, we sat for a while, put her back onto the chair, we took her back to the hotel. Guess what? We arrived before the whole crowd. We arrived back to the hotel, completed that whole umrah before that crowd or the others who didn't want to take them uh, had completed. And then we got talking, then she explained to me that when she was young, I think about six years old, she, she, as she was walking on the streets or something, a car bashed into her. And she lost both legs. They, she became paralyzed. So the legs are there, but she's paralyzed waist down. And she says, I really want to get married. And I'm really looking for a brother. Anyone, if you know anyone who's going to marry me, please let me know. I've been praying for a long, long time. I told the sister, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely heard your dua. And keep on trying and I will try. And, and I did speak to a few brothers. But you know, it's not easy to make a decision to marry someone who is... Disabled, who's paralyzed, waist down. Okay? Although they become very independent at a time, besides one or two things they would need a little bit of help with. Guess what? Take a guess. The brother with you married her. Oh, that would have been a miracle. He said, The brother with you married her. I said, No, 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 no. Hang on. But she communicated with me, I think about two or three months back. And told me, inshallah, my nikah is on this and this date. A beautiful brother. And she sent me a picture of him. A beautiful, beautiful brother, mashallah. Amazing revert brother. If I'm not mistaken, yes, he was revert. And she says, you know, Allah definitely has blessed me. It's amazing. And now the nikah is actually done. And they're waiting to do their wedding. And inshallah, they're going to be together. What's the moral of it? The dua. Don't underestimate it. Not at all. If Allah heard that, and this, the husband is a normal person, completely normal, nothing wrong with him. And he decided on marrying the sister. Whatever he saw in her, the qualities, whatever else. And he was ready to serve for the sake of Allah. May Allah accept it from him and from her too. I'm sure it's a sacrifice for her, her family, and so on. It's not easy. You see, it's not easy for people who are brought up within a culture to actually open their doors to people of another culture when it comes to marriage. It's a problem we're facing every day. Today, one of the brothers at Iman Channel was asking me, what's the question you get asked most? I told him, relationships. Straight. Mostly to do with intercultural, interracial marriages. That's the most. There's nothing more than that. And then to do with the marriage and the divorce, following very closely thereafter. A lot of it is to do with marital problems. And I can relate the two because you know what? People end up marrying who they don't want to marry based on the pressure from families. The problem is being resolved slowly but surely. But at the same time, you have a lot of cases where people get married and then they say, after a few years, you know, you were not the person I wanted to marry. I was actually in love with someone else and you know, my dad was just pushing me. Imagine how you would feel if you were told that. I mean, come on, just to be honest. And those parents are the criminals. The ones who force their children, they are the criminals. Because nobody would like to be told that, you know what, I, I didn't want to marry you. And so many are being told that. 
May Allah forgive us. Going back to the dua. I can, I can give you many more examples of how Allah answers duas. Not just one, but so many. And with us, so much that we have, we haven't even made a dua for, but Allah's taken care of it already. A lot of what you have, we take it for granted until the day it goes. Because Allah's given it to you. So it's amazing. You know, if someone were to oppress you, hurt you, harm you, the hadith says, اِتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ Be careful of the dua made against you by the one whom you have wronged. For definitely there is no barrier between that supplication and Allah. So if someone has wronged you or you have wronged someone and the supplication goes up to Allah, it's a matter of time before destruction comes. Destruction comes in the way of the person who was the oppressor. That window period is given by Allah Almighty in order for us to change our ways, perhaps to regret, perhaps to repent, perhaps to make amends. And I've seen that it may be a few years but the circle closes. I promise you it does. I've seen in my life people who have been destroyed because they have destroyed others. So those who think they can get away with murder, those who think they can get away with oppression, they will never get away with it. It's a promise of the Almighty. Allah cannot allow that to happen. And this is why I say the prophetic way is to pray for those who've hurt you because you know you've got that prayer. Look at how the Prophet ﷺ made dua for goodness for the people of Ta'if. Look at how the Prophet ﷺ made dua, supplication for the goodness of the likes of Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Jahl. He could have said, oh Allah, destroy these. He says, oh Allah, guide them. Wow, big difference between what we would say and what he said. In Ta'if, he says, oh Allah, they don't know what they're doing. Guide them. They don't know what they're doing. Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Allah, my people, they don't know. Guide them. But many of us, immediately you say, Allah, break them, destroy them, kill them, whatever else them, but make sure they don't come in front of my face again. Yes, that's what people do say. That's unfortunate. That's very sad. We shouldn't do that. Try the good dua. The good dua. And when we go through our own hardship, our own difficulty, and you've made the dua, like I said, it's a matter of time. Because we don't get it when we wanted it, we become upset with Allah. Allah will give it to you at a certain time. And then again, when He knows that it's correct for you. Because if He hasn't given it to you, He knows it's not good for you. I tell you a story of a sister. Many years back, and it's a true story I heard from a very reliable source. They had flown from Syria to the States and they were catching a connecting flight and for some reason they wanted the girls to take off their hijab for the photographs. The one did, the other one did, and for security purposes, by the way, you would be allowed to, there would be a scope of that permission. So... The third one did, but the little one, according to what I heard, I'm trying to relate it as accurately as I, as I heard it. She said, look, I can't, and I'm not going to, but why not? And they tried to convince her, and they spoke to her, and the family, she says, no way. And they said this, and they said that, and then it got to a higher level where they almost threatened to send them back. She says, I don't care, I'm not compromising this. And notice, there is a leeway, like I said, there is a leeway <laughs> to actually, for security purposes, to be checked, yes. Respectfully so, but there is a leeway. If you were told, I'd like to see your face, and that happens to be a person in authority, and you know there are security personnel, there is permission in Islam to actually show that face, because security is very important. But she says, no, I'm not going to do this. And this wasn't about covering the face. This was about covering the hair. And she says, no. And guess what happened? They had a meeting or they decided or one of the top guys decided, you know what, just let it happen. It's okay. Take that picture. Take the photo as she is. It's okay. It's fine. So at that juncture, they decided they're going to allow her with this hijab to take the picture. But because it took so long to come to the decision, they missed their connecting flight. They missed their connecting flight. As a result of this, 
At that time, no mobile phones, you know. People were just told, we're going to arrive this flight, this time. The father who was waiting in the other city, when they caught the next plane, a few hours later, and arrived, they felt the emotions of those where they had arrived. And the father was saying, ah, oh, thank Allah, you guys are safe. Why are you safe? You know, the, the, the aircraft you guys were supposed to be in, it actually blew up in midair. There was a crash and everybody died. Wallahi, it's a true story. Saved by what? You can say the hijab, but saved by Allah. So this is why sometimes we get irritated because of something, but Allah knows best. I can give you an example of what happened today. I have a habit of saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, as many times when things don't go the way I want them to go. My sister had arrived here for a family wedding that we had yesterday and the day before. She lives up north. And so my son was with, and they were traveling back. And I told them, don't worry, I'll take you to Houston. So I drove them to Houston this afternoon. The train was, uh, I think, at quarter to three, if I'm not mistaken, and we left very early at about one something. And we arrived 15 minutes ahead of time. But the problem is I'm not from London, so I don't know when the, when the navigation tells you you have arrived. That's in the middle of the road, bro. I'm just looking this way. I'm looking that way. I can't see anything familiar here. I say, hang on, we probably need to go in somewhere, but there is a way of doing it. So I told my, my son, why don't you type into the, the map Virgin Trains, Houston. He said, it says here, first class Virgin Trains. I said, click yes. So it, it decided to take us round. As I'm following it, there must have been a car crash or whatever there must have been. And now it's showing us you're going to arrive at 46. Whoa. Because it took us down and brought us back. I don't even know. Subhanallah. And I just said, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank Allah. Smiling. <laughs> you know. And just as well, you know, my sister, my, my, my family, and my, my son, they think similar to my thinking, Alhamdulillah, no one was upset. And I'm thinking if it was anyone else, they would, the world would come to an end. The world would come to an end. And so I told them, just get the next train and inshallah things will be okay. Later on, I decided to call them. You know, you've got to be careful how you call because you're not allowed to touch your phone when you're driving. So I called them. And I said, what happened? They said, look, the next train, this ticket is gone, right? The next train is more than three times the price of this, so there's no point in taking it. The next possible train that we could perhaps lose the least amount of money is at 8.30. I said, let me come and collect you. They said, no, we're not going to let that happen again. Okay, that was okay. But alhamdulillah, a little while later, I called one of my cousins telling him, you know, this is what happened. He says, we live... Five minutes from there, ten minutes from there. Guess what? Allah wanted them to meet with the family, cousins, nephews and nieces. And they got together, subhanAllah, after a long time. But that was the plan of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know sometimes when we've used the excuse, it's the plan of Allah, people will tell us, you know what, you're just saying it's the plan of Allah, but you're guilty of being late. Because we are last minute dot com people, let's be honest. You know, your husband or wife or whoever it is, and you didn't make it and you say, but now you were wasting time. But it's the plan of Allah. You don't blame the plan of Allah when you are guilty. You only say the plan of Allah when you know you've done whatever was in your capacity to have achieved what you could. And then you say, yes, it was the plan of Allah. But still, be happy. Say Alhamdulillah twice. I always say when things happen your way, say Alhamdulillah. A praise be to Allah. When they happen not, when they don't happen your way, they're happening the way of Allah. So say Alhamdulillah two times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. So my brothers and sisters, I have a few more minutes and inshallah I want to encourage every one of us to reach out to those who are in need by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know there are many aid organizations and a lot of them are doing good work. I am one who actually supports all those who do good work. So you won't really notice me bad-mouthing anyone. That's, that's a character that I've tried to develop. You won't notice me bad-mouthing anyone because I believe a friend will help you or will not harm you. That's the least. If you haven't harmed me, 
You're my friend. Sometimes I don't even need help. I just need you not to harm. You know, if you hear something bad, keep quiet at least. Even if you don't have the courage to clarify, no problem. Don't spread it. Subhanallah. That's the least. That's true friendship. Subhanallah. There was a time when we used to say, well, a true friend would clarify it. And they, no, no, no. Times have changed. True friends are those who neither help you nor harm you. True friend. That's, that's the age we're at. And if you have someone who really helps you, well, thank Allah, they're beyond what a lot of people are. So my brothers and sisters, I'm sure in a few moments, the, the aid organizations, Muslim aid, will actually be calling out to you to help, to assist. Let's remember, whatever we give, Allah will, inshallah, give us even more. Whatever we pledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return for us. How much are we going to spend in our lives? If we can help others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely help us. It's really been uh, very, very great to be here this evening with all these beautiful faces. I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but I pray that we've all benefited, starting with myself. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.